Okay, hi everyone. Um, so as I promised, I'm uh, just going to kind of maybe have these little extra material videos where I go through some kind of extensions to stuff that I couldn't get through in class. I really wanted to talk about them, but they just take up too much time and they're a bit tangential to the course. So I just purge them out of the main lecture slides and put them here. Um, and they're probably not going to be very useful for your assignments, but maybe you'll find them intellectually enriching and otherwise they'll give you more value for your degree. So I hope you don't mind me putting them up. Feel free to just completely ignore them. Here's the first one based on some of the material I cut out of our lecture on psychology and sociological insights for public policy. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was just give a little bit more background on this example that I gave of a sort of rent seeking arrangement. So a situation where people are trying to make money without doing anything productive. I didn't really have time to explain this case study. So Boris Johnson is one of the last things he did in office, he was weighing up, so he didn't introduce it, but he was considering introducing 50 year mortgages that children can inherit. Now, the only reason why you would need a 50 year mortgage is because you're paying it off so slowly. So you're making barely a dent in the principal every year, you're only paying off the interest. And so it takes you 50 years to slowly chip away at that principal until after maybe 30 years you've got it down to the point where now in 20 years you're going to pay it off. So this must be a massive mortgage. And certainly over a 50 year time horizon, you will, I suspect, in almost all cases, pay more in interest than the actual value of the house. Right? So you will probably pay more than double the market value of this property. So this is a situation where creditors, so the people that have the asset in the first place, the mortgage or whatever it might be, the people who are lending it out, are essentially kind of locking people in for 50 years to an extractive arrangement where those people are basically just paying them interest in exchange for nothing in particular. Right, so these creditors are doing really nothing in this situation. You could say that their capital's at risk, okay? But it's not really at risk because if it can be inherited by your children, that means that you can't discharge it in bankruptcy, right? It means that someone is always on the hook for this money. And this is a classic sort of example of a nefarious attempt to create a rent, this sort of cash stream coming in from these people that are in debt bondage and just make money off that without doing anything productive for society. And this is very similar to how aristocrats used to operate. Aristocrats would inherit the land and then people would be in serfdom so they weren't allowed to leave and they were forced to work that land. They had no other way of doing it. So often in many countries, aristocracy and serfdom were in a long-term bondage relationship so the serfs couldn't leave and their children were also tied to the aristocrat. This is basically just a new version of that, which is why a lot of people like Yanis Varoufakis, for example, have started talking about contemporary rentier capitalism and a kind of techno-feudalism and all sorts of other similar throwbacks to an earlier aristocratic era. So always be mindful, I think, in your policy discussions of this kind of behavior. We talk a lot about inclusivity and inequality at the moment, and that's kind of important but often what you really want to look at is just raw power being used to extract money or value of some sort from people. That is the origin of all inequality is power and money. All right. Talking about then all these behavioral things that we discussed and particularly the East framework, easy, attractive, social and timely. One of the main benefits of that EAST approach to government communications is it reduces the cognitive load associated with doing the right thing. So the cognitive load of paying your taxes when you get a huge document from the US tax office, multiple pages just covered in fine print that's very difficult to understand, is that you need to spend so much time with that system two rational processing going on, trying to sift through all that and make sure you've got it right. If you can make that easy and it's just a few button clicks and it's a nicely laid out website, that sort of thing, you're reducing that cognitive load. Now, often you see that cognitive load used in the opposite way, used in a deliberately punitive, pernicious way to crush people. 
So, so many of the injustices in our society are perpetuated, often deliberately, through exhaustion. So, when people get interviewed by the police, for example, or when you get interviewed by immigration authorities at the airport, you often just get taken for a ride there for hours. You know, you just sit in a room, not knowing what's going on, there's no windows, you can't see outside, then they take you to another room, you just sit there, no one's explaining anything, and they're just slowly exhausting you, slowly kind of sapping your will to resist. Similar kind of things with how refugees are treated in my home country of Australia, we just lock them up indefinitely and wait to see what happens. We just try and break their spirits. And we see this kind of behavior in a lot of places. For example, in job centers, you have all this paperwork that you have to fill out every week. You have to show that you've looked for X number of jobs. And after a while, even if you haven't found a job that's good for you, even if really from an ethical point of view, you should be entitled to a bit of help from the state to just tide you over for another couple of weeks until you find a good job, one that you really like, one that's going to pay you what you're worth, one that you're going to stick with for a while. You can't be bothered searching for that job because you just don't want to deal with this bloody paperwork anymore. And so you take a shit job. And ultimately it's bad for the state in the long run, but it doesn't matter if all you really care about as a politician is reducing the number of people on unemployment benefits. And the weapon you use against them is exhaustion, is giving them cognitive load. All right. One aspect of this that we see in neoliberalism, so this period from about, say, 1980 to 2020, um, where a lot of things were outsourced, a lot of things were privatised, we saw a lot of discussion of things like user pays, these sorts of things, is that administrative costs and the associated cognitive burden of doing administration, of working your way through processes, has been passed from governments and firms onto consumers. That's the basic idea with Ryanair. So Ryanair will allow you to decide where you want to sit, how much luggage do you want to purchase, do you want to pay for the carbon offset, do you want priority boarding, all this kind of stuff. And they'll pass that on to you as cost savings, like it's genuine, but as part of that cost saving, they are passing cognitive burden on to you. And it will always be justified as lower prices, lower taxes, more freedom. But it's also a much higher opportunity cost, and we are not particularly good as animals at pricing cognitive burden because it's not something we're really used to. One thing that this does is it means that we are responsible for everything, right? It might be the case that in the past you had lower salary, but a lot of stuff was taken care of. This is kind of the difference between living in Denmark and living in America. Your salary is much higher in America, but you also have to pay for everything. You have to worry about the school, the healthcare system, your, anyway, everything. Everything, you have to take care of it yourself, which means that, okay, you've got more money to spend on it, if you're wealthy, but you also have to deal with the cognitive load. And people who are poor in America don't have the money, but they do have the cognitive load. So they're in a particularly exhausted, angry, stressed state, and it's unsurprising that they act out when they're so cognitively burdened. All right, now one aspect of this that I think is really interesting is to look at how it's affected care. So the shift to user pays in public services, the privatization of public services, and the commercialization of care work specifically. We can think of care broadly, so not just healthcare and social care and elderly care, but just generally the idea of trying to have a warm personal relationship with someone who comes into the job center, or someone who comes into the doctor's office, or whatever it might be, with the council workers. That has all been commercialized. It's been turned into a transactional relationship, the way we looked at with that Israeli child care centre. One consequence of this is that care has become kind of professional. It feels like something that you need to be qualified for. And so we often don't feel qualified to give care. I don't have any qualification as an elderly care worker, so how can I possibly take care of my grandfather? I'm just going to put my grandfather in a home and they can deal with it. I don't feel qualified to give people mental health advice. All sorts of complex stuff could be going on there. So I can't give my friend a shoulder to cry on a person to talk through their issues with. Same with babysitting, parenting, career guidance, whatever it might be. We just don't feel qualified to give care. The commercialization and financialization of care also makes us see it as something that deserves compensation. So we've professionalized it. And that means that we're quite reluctant to ask for care 
because we feel like we owe people something if they give us care and that's kind of always been true i mean care is something that we think of as as at least embedded in reciprocal relationships and the stuff we talked about in the seminars about co conditional cooperation so i will cooperate with you if you help me so when i'm unwell you take care of me but when you're unwell i'll take care of you but there's a broader issue here like even beyond morality or this kind of reciprocal relationship so we have transactional reciprocal and then we have a third option that we might think is a kind of karmic economy so if you trust that the people around you care generally not about you specifically but about people in general if there is what we might call solidarity if there is solidarity then you think people pay it forward so i'm going to help you not because i think you are going to help me back but because I think that creates the kind of culture wherein people help each other. So I'll help you, you'll help someone else, and so on down the line. And that means that when I need help, someone's going to be around to help me. This is a kind of karmic sort of relationship, and it's the foundation of healthy, strong communities, as opposed to, say, the very transactional relationships that characterize market relations. And I'm not, like, I love markets, I'm an economist, I'm all about that kind of stuff. But we don't want to lose sight of this third thing. And we also don't want to think that community and morality just means reciprocity. It can mean this kind of karmic, pay it forward, generosity society. All right. I talked a little bit about backlash effects in the lecture. And I just wanted to raise that one of the main areas of research in backlash effects is around how to get women into more position, more senior positions, how to reduce the gender wage gap, these kind of issues of inequality. So there are big backlash issues in gender policy particularly i suspect as a generational thing so like my generation i think your generation even more so you won't see these kind of backlash effects but with the boomers um, and even gen x there's a lot more kind of stereotypes associated with how women ought to behave in certain settings and so when women break those behaviors for example by being bossy um, which is in fact just behaving like a normal manager and pulling rank then they seem to be behaving counter stereotypically as a woman and there's a backlash effect for that so for example self-promotion by women in workplaces which is very common for dudes to explain how awesome they are seen as very negatively when women behave that way female leaders and other powerful women are often perceived negatively just for breaking the stereotype so julia gillard who i've got here australian prime minister um, very famously bore the brunt of this kind of thing and gave this uh, very famous speech. I believe it did make it internationally, but it was huge in Australia. Just uh, Google the misogyny speech, Julia Gillard. So the opposition leader, Tony Abbott, was a big time misogynist. Pretty hard to sustain a claim that he was not a misogynist. And he was criticising her for not disciplining the Speaker of the Parliament for misogynistic behaviour. And she went off at him. And it is a great speech. <laughs> Um, one other thing that's interesting about this stuff is the so-called glass cliff phenomenon, where there's a fair, seemingly fairly statistically robust occurrence, it's not just like random noise, um, that women tend to get promoted into senior executive positions in firms as they're failing. So those women are kind of set up to fail. And I guess a very recent example of that here in the UK is Liz Truss being promoted to the Tory leadership just as the party was imploding. And so she, in a sense, has now cleaned the party. She took all the insanity of it, and Rishi Sunak can kind of be seen to be swanning in um, and you know, taking the reins, and he steered it all into good waters. All right, the last thing I wanted to talk about is this little case study um, of Sudhir Venkatesh's work in the projects in Chicago. Um, so Sudhir went to do a PhD in sociology, as I understand it, at Chicago. Um, he wanted to do um, mostly statistics and he was told, yeah, that's cool, do whatever you need to do, but do not go into that neighbourhood because you'll just get shot. Um, and so he had this strong suspicion that the statistics that were being collected, like the kind of survey questions that were being asked to understand poverty in America, and particularly poverty in these big social housing tenements, were the wrong questions. They weren't asking the right things. So, you know... He um, you know, just was kind of brave, some might say foolish, and walked into one of these projects and tried to interview people, just tried to ask them the questions that were usually asked as part of these poverty surveys, and no one would really talk to him. People thought he was a bit weird. People, some people told him, like, these questions are bizarre questions, they're not the right questions, bro. I don't 
don't really know what you're talking about. Anyway, towards the end of the first day, Sadir's feeling a bit dejected, and suddenly he gets manhandled by two, I don't know what the polite term is nowadays, gangsters um, in this uh, social housing tournament, um, who suspect that he is a member of a um, Central Asian, like Mexican gang, that's trying to move in on their drug dealing turf. Uh, and he gets dragged in front of the head of the gang, um, and he, that guy's like, what are you doing here? He would have said it more aggressively than that. <laughs> uh, and so Satu explain himself, you know, I'm not here dealing drugs or anything. I'm just trying to get a better sociological understanding of the project so that we can improve the kind of research we're doing over at the University of Chicago. And this gang leader, you know, bit of a sharper tool in the shed relative to the other members of the gang. He said, all right, man, look, that's, that's all good. Just don't, don't come back here. I never want to see you again. If you come here again, you're going to get shot. Um, anyway, Sadir comes back the next day <laughs> because he has assessed that this guy kind of likes to be in the limelight, this gang leader, uh, and that he might actually quite like it to have a book written about him. And so this book that came out of a gang leader for a day, which is based on Sadir's um, PhD thesis, was basically built on him doing ethnographic work in this um, quite famous social housing block in Chicago, shadowing this gang for a very long time, understanding the economics of the drug trade in these buildings, understanding the kind of politics and culture of the gangs, and getting a much better understanding of how poverty works um, in contemporary African-American um, and other deprived communities. Uh, and as a result of that, you know, again, really interesting new sort of survey ideas coming out of it about how to measure these sorts of phenomena and how to deal with them, similar to the kind of radical change we got out of um, Dubois' work in the African-American communities in Atlanta. So I guess I'm just saying, like, we get a bit more sociology going on in public policy, not just uh, economics. All right, uh, I think that's it for my slideshow. Hope that was kind of entertaining. I'll upload this video to Moodle. Thanks and goodbye.